Um, today I'm going to talk about, um, mostly I'll, I'll focus on some uh, computational neuroscience work um, that we've done recently on uh, building models of predictive reasoning in, uh, in the brain for neuroscience purposes. Um, and then I'll also talk about some related concepts in machine learning um, that we've been applying more to the making models that can do cool stuff, but maybe don't look as much like the brain category. Um, so um, to start off, um, I've been uh, I've been using this as sort of like my my intro for a little while now because I, um, I I just like really like this uh, piece of art as an illustration of the challenge of having a representation that you want to reason about. Um, this is from an exhibit um, that I went to a while ago um, called "When Artists Drew Maps," um, and it was all about. Um, how maps used to be drawn in, in medieval times when, you know, that was uh, like the primary basis for co conveying uh, spatial information. Um, so um, this map in particular is really interesting just because they've kind of like shoved all of these different kinds of information into this same unified representation. Um, you have like a, a loose representation of the, the actual spatial structure, the geography. Um, you don't get the sense that these roads and rivers are, are exactly capturing 2D coordinates, but the connectivity structure is probably there. I doubt there's any intersections between streets that aren't actually present. Um, a lot of things are not represented in super high resolution. There's only a few trees. There's like vast white spaces in between salient landmarks, um, but some of the structural objects are represented um, both in a lot of detail, also in a, a different coordinate frame and egocentric coordinates. Um, you really like, Kind of have this mingling of how you could get different information as you explore uh, this environment that's reflected in this map um, and it tells you a lot about what this map is used for and also what it's not used for um, you wouldn't want to be doing like dead reckoning with this map and wandering through the woods you probably wouldn't you know be able to trace a vector um, to its actual destination um, so um, this is kind of an example of a of a human map, a, a kind of representation um, that that humans might find useful for reasoning. Um, and exactly what it means to be useful for reasoning um, is is a hard thing to formalize. Um, and a perspective that we've used for a while for this is reinforcement learning. Um, and reinforcement learning is a way of setting up um, reasoning and learning problems. Um, it's it's a common framework for for trying to capture some degree of autonomous reasoning. Um, and the framework uh, is, is usually described something like this. Given some task, an agent learns a policy for taking actions that maximize total expected reward over future states by trial and error. Um, so in every reinforcement learning task, um, you define what reward looks like for that task, you define what your states are, and you define the structure that allows you to transition between them. Uh, and then you have an agent that tries to figure out how to take actions in this space. Um, it's a pretty general framework. It can be applied to lots of different kinds of reasoning problems. Um, you can apply it to games like chess. Um, and here, your state is the configuration of pieces on the board. You can transition by taking moves. Those are the agent's actions. And you want to maximize the probability of winning the game. That's your reward signal. You can apply it to something like making a baby laugh where your actions are maybe something like making goofy faces and your reward signal is if the baby is laughing or your negative reward signal might be if the baby is crying. And we can apply it to things like spatial reasoning, um, where you have maybe a classic rat in a maze foraging, trying to find tasty morsels such as Fruit Loops, um, which is a delicious American breakfast cereal, which is sometimes used as rewards um, for rats in mazes. Um, and in an environment like a maze, there's a lot of different options that we have for how to describe our, our states. Um, you could say that your location is your XY coordinate in this environment. You could say, you could discretize the environment, uh, make a tabular environment, super common for reinforcement learning experiments, um, and say your state is described by which of these uh, little locations you're nearest to. You could have a more abstract representation where you chunk your environment into dead ends and pathways between things might be useful as like a form of temporal abstraction. Um, basically, even in kind of simple environments, there's a lot of degrees of freedom over how to represent an environment uh, and, and like what representation, what information is meaningful to the reasoning process that you're going to perform on top of it. Um, and reinforcement learning in general 
it's, it's a general framework, but it's often very hard because if you're only interested in taking actions that maximize your expected reward, you might be throwing away a lot of information. Every action you take that doesn't um, have a pre-established association with reward is just something that you totally ignore unless you have an additional learning process that's going on. Um, so, so this is really a, an issue of throwing away information. Um, if I reach a reward location, um, all of the states that I've seen before that I might not have learned anything about just because I didn't know their association with reward until that very first time. Um, so what we're interested in here is learning a representation that makes downstream learning easier. Basically, what is the right representation of this maze or the chessboard or these funny faces that simplifies your environment without throwing away too much information and makes downstream learning processes easier? Um, so this is an area of, uh, of, of machine learning that has had a lot of attention paid to it, um, this, this problem of how to form a sophisticated representation of your environment that makes learning easier. Um, there's a lot of different methods people apply and a lot of different principles, um, and we'll focus on two in particular. Um, one is this problem of what kind of information should we learn to represent besides the reward itself. Um, ultimately, we want to maximize our reward, but we want to learn about an, enough structure in the environment that we can scaffold our reward predictions. Um, and one theory for doing this is that you should just learn to predict as much as possible about your environment. Um, maybe I'm wandering around an environment. I don't know what my goal is yet. I don't know where reward is, but I know that when I was at state one and I took some action, then I got to state two. So I'm going to remember that. I'm going to form a map of how different states predict each other. And then when I finally get to a goal location, I'll be able to reverse engineer how I got there and, and generalize that reward information to all the states that could have predicted it. Um, the kind of intuition for why this is useful is that predicting reward is a special case of predicting anything that could possibly happen. And so if you learn to predict as much stuff as possible, probably your goal will be in the, in the hull of things you've pre uh, predicted. It'll be somewhere contained in that space. Um, of course, if you're learning everything about the environment, you now have a much bigger learning problem. Um, and uh, learning in the real world setting is already kind of challenging because of high, how high dimensional it is. Um, so another big principle across many areas of, uh, of computer science and machine learning and math, but, but also in this case of reinforcement learning is compression. How can we learn a, a short description of the predictive dynamics we've learned? Um, and there's many forms of this. Um, in, in these little environments that I uh, illustrated here, they might be if your environment organizes itself into clusters or if it has a low dimensional structure that you could um, pull out from it. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some work today that's building um, on some work that we started a, a while ago. Um, in the work that we did in 2017, we hypothesized that the, the hippocampal circuit, um, play cells in hippocampus and grid cells in entorhinal cortex um, were helping um, serve a representational purpose, um, that play cells were representing information about how states predict each other, um, how, how locations in your environment can lead to each other, and grid cells were forming a compressed representation of that that was useful for, for trying to identify um, commonalities across states. Um, so I'll first illustrate the um, uh, basic gist of this model, um, and then I'll talk about how we've built on it in some later work. Um, and then at the end of the talk, I'll move on to some stuff with neural networks. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, so to, to contextualize this in the space of, of classical um, place cell models, um, this is kind of a cartoonishly simple view at this point, but uh, bear with me for the sake of like exposition. Um, Let's say um, a classic place cell representation um, might look like this. Um, you have lots of cells that care about different locations in an environment, um, and um, they fire proportionally to the um, animal's distance from those cells uh, modulated by a Gaussian. Um, so the firing rate of each cell, this is the equation for a Gaussian. Um, it's a computational neuroscience seminar, so got to have some equations. Um, each cell has a preferred location. Um, the distance of the animal from that location fed into a Gaussian will be proportional to that cell's firing. Um, the, um, a, a predictive representation view, and here we're using a specific kind of predictive representation called a successor representation, um, can be written down um, as follows. 
Here, each cell, instead of encoding distance from the location per se, will encode predictions about how much that state will be visited in the near future. Um, and the equation for that in matrix form looks like this. Um, uh, capital T is going to be the transition matrix. Um, so capital T to the power of little t is where the animal is likely to be. Um, little t steps into the future. Gamma, this term here, is a discount factor. Um, and this is a value between 0 and 1. And it's also raised to the power of t, so it decays. Um, and what this means is that when we sum up where we're likely to be in the future, um, we're discounting it so that places we're going to be immediately in the future count more than states very far into the future. Um, that's why this, uh, this, this function over the population has this decay as a function of your distance from the animal. Um, and then this here is a, a sum from little t equals zero to infinity. Um, so that means we're summing over all future time steps. Um, so we're basically saying, um, how much am I going to visit every state in my environment in the future with a discount applied so that states that I'm going to visit right away count more than states that I'm going to visit in the distant future. Um, and we're hypothesizing that every cell in this in the hippocampal population has a particular state or, or maybe more abstractly feature that it cares about, and its firing rate will be proportional to the discounted uh, future activation of that feature. Um, the, oops, sorry. So the basic um, utility of this representation um, in the context of reinforcement learning can be summarized by it supporting um, flexible generalization when your reward moves around. Um, so let's say I associate some location with reward. Um, then I can say my expected future reward is going to be proportional to how much I visit that state times the reward I get when I get there. So I automatically know expected future reward um, if I know which states are associated with reward. It's kind of an, an automatic way of, of summing under the dynamics of your policy. Um, if this reward moves, then I can quickly recompute the future value because I've separated these computations about these, these, uh, this, this expected um, reward function into a term, which is where am I expected to go and how much reward will I get there? I'm sort of pre-computing um, statistics about occupancy um, and then using this to simplify um, reward computations. Um, you can kind of think of this also as like being generally useful as a form of sequence compression. Um, instead of saying, um, where, which states will I visit if I first take this action and then take this other action and then take this other action, which takes a lot of time to compute. This is the more classic model-based way to do computations. I can just say, on average, where am I going to end up under my current policy? Um, it's a way of really like summarizing the dynamics efficiently of, of your um, current policy. Um, so this model makes a couple of predictions. Um, I won't go into them in, in too much um, detail because uh, it's kind of um, old news. But um, the key prediction um, that it makes is that you'll see uh, asymmetric backwards expansion of place cells once the animal has experienced traveling uh, preferentially in one direction. Um, this is something that you see in place cells. Um, also makes some predictions about how the geometry of the environment um, will affect place cells. Um, because that'll affect how you can move through the environment. It'll affect your experience. Um, and, um, and then because this model is based on predictions rather than spatial coordinates per se, since it's all about temporal statistics rather than um, a spatial coordinate frame, we can also make predictions about how um, uh, temporal aspects of your experience affect the representations too. Um, so if you decouple um, which states are near each other in time versus space, that has some effect on hippocampal representations. Um, this is also true in tasks that are just entirely temporal, um, like these sequence learning um, experiments that Anna Shapiro did a while back. Um, cool. So we can explain some data, um, and that's very nice. Um, the model has favorable normative properties, um, but um, it's a bit rigid in some ways. Um, so basically, the, the pros of the model are that it has some computational efficiency for, for reasoning, um, as, as I mentioned with this uh, flexibility under goal changes. Um, it has some other advantages too. It can give you interpretable representations of states. Um, it has uh, predictive information stored in an efficient way, um, and it can capture spatial and also temporal effects on representations. Um, 
But from both a, a normative perspective um, and also from a fitting the data perspective, it's a limited model. Um, it's, it's pretty rigid. Um, and this might be something that you already picked up on in looking at this, this plot where we change the reward association, which is that if the goals change, your dynamics are probably going to change too. Your, your policy for selecting actions is going to change. Maybe I used to go to the left a lot because reward is on the left. If reward now moves to the right, I can compute my expected reward under a policy where I'm going to the left. It's not very much reward. And soon I will use this to change my policy and, and do something different. So it's useful for policy evaluation, um, but it needs to exist within this broader context where you can also update your policies and then change your model too. Um, and once you change that, you need to do some relearning and the efficiency benefits start to melt away. Um, so some of the policies for what do you do if your goals change and you need to update um, your, your policy. One, you could just apply um, what's sometimes called the ostrich algorithm. You could just ignore it and, and hope it still works. Um, and this sometimes works because under uh, certain assumptions about the natural distribution of tasks, your new policies will have some things in common with your old ones. So you could just use the old successor representation, hope it generalizes kind of well and, and slowly update it as needed. Um, you could also update the model with replay um, where you have, uh, and this is a way to really like leverage the benefit of a small amount of experience. If you have an experience that says, hey, actually this other path is better than what I was doing, you can keep replaying that experience and, and retrain your, your predictive representation. Um, you could use a combination of successor representations or default representation and then learn deviations. Um, these are some uh, um, modern approaches that, well, I, actually some of these are from 2016 at this point, but some of these are a little more recent um, where you basically like try to use a successor representation in the context of a model that can flexibly update it or interpolate between different models. Um, and what we're gonna talk about um, is, is an alternative where you're using a probabilistic successor representation to try and represent your uncertainty about transitions and also to have more efficient updates um, and communicate confidence. So this is sort of a way you can mitigate the wrongness of the original model and try and update it more efficiently um, without necessarily having to go through some of these more complex steps. Um, so um, this is work that was done by Jesse Gertz. Um, he's, um, uh, he was a graduate student with Neil Burgess at the time of this work. He's soon starting a postdoc with Claudia Klopath. Um, and this work was done in collaboration with Sam Gershman, as well as Neil Burgess. Um, Jesse, uh, was a fantastic graduate student. He, uh, he, he did a really good job with this project and also, uh, another project I'll, I'll just kind of present briefly later on. Um, it was really lovely working with him and also collaborating with Sam again and with Neil Burgess. Um, the, um, okay. So. To kind of illustrate how we make this probabilistic, um, we're going to uh, start with a simple environment. Um, this is a tabular linear environment, a tabular track, um, where there are five states and they're all connected in a line. Um, we have a, a little mouse um, on state one, and it can only move in the rightward direction. So if we were going to represent that first state, with a successor representation, a, a classic su successor representation, we would get something that looked like what I showed a few slides ago, something that kind of decays in the direction of the animal's travel if you organize these states along the x-axis. Um, and this decay happens um, because uh, we have the discount factor, which cares about locality. Um, it's decaying um, to the right, partly because the animal's in the leftmost state, so it doesn't have an option. But even if we had this for other states, it would decay to the right because that's the direction of travel for the animal. Um, and a classic successor representation is just going to learn um, a point estimate um, over every other state in the environment. Um, under the probabilistic variant, we're going to learn a distribution of values um, for how much you're going to visit every other state in your environment. So instead of a point estimate, we're going to learn a distribution um, over expected occupancy. Um, and the technique we're going to use to do this um, is to um, put this into the um, formalism of Kalman TD learning. Um, this is a technique developed by Geistin Pietkin in uh, 2011. Um, and it's also been brought to neuroscience by Sam Gershman. Um, he's, he's shown that you can use this for reinforcement learning um, to explain some uh, behavioral effects that you see in animals under a probabilistic perspective. Um, and here we wanted to really apply kind of the same technique, the same math to the context of learning a predictive representation um, instead of the context of learning a value function. Um, so 
Um, the generative model um, looks like this. Um, on each time step, we're going to get some new information about what state we got, and we're going to use it to update our estimate of this uh, probabilistic successor representation. Um, there's going to be two terms that we learn, um, and I'm going to go into them in a little bit of detail to give an intuition for how the model works. Um, the first, the term on the left, is the successor representation. Um, this is the same as that, that plot that I showed on the previous slide, um, this uh, bar plot right here. Um, but instead of just showing one row of it, as I'm showing here, now we're showing the successor representation for every state in the environment. So if you're in state one, you predict that you go visit all these states to the right of you. If you're in state two, you're not going to go to state one at all, but you're going to go to these states to the right. And that's why the matrix um, has positive values on the upper triangle and zero values on the lower triangle. Um, you can think of each entry in this matrix as saying, given my current state denoted by row, how much will I visit future states denoted by column? So that's the classic successor representation. When we're doing the probabilistic version, the Kalman SRTD version, then we're also keeping track of the covariance structure so that we can describe the shape of the probabilistic distribution. Um, and here, this will convey how do these expected state occupancies vary and co-vary. Um, so you can think of the diagonal entries as saying, what is the variance, um, or, or which can be interpreted as what is my certainty? about the predictions, how consistent are these predictions under my policy. Um, and you can think of these off-diagonal uh, entries as how do predictions co-vary. Um, maybe if I often go in a line, as I do here, then my predictions about going from state one to state two will co-vary with my predictions about going from state two to state three. Um, and, and these are both values, both the uncertainty and the um, covariance are things that we'll leverage in some of our later um, simulations. Um, the, um, we're going to do a use a variant of the TD update rule. Um, so for a classic successor representation, you can learn this with a TD rule where you have some prediction about where you're going to go next, and then you see the actual state you see next, and then you have a prediction error um, about uh, like ab ab about your state occupancy based on this. Um, and this is basically what's written here. Um, delta is your prediction error, eta is your learning rate, and we're updating our successor representation, which for historical reasons is named M. Um, the Kalman TD update rule looks a little different. It looks a little more complicated, but you can see some of the same structure. Um, this first line here for updating the, the successor representation matrix is essentially the same. The key difference is this term K. Um, K is an adaptive learning rate. Um, and um, I won't go into most of these terms, but the key thing about the adaptive learning rate to know um, is that it has the covariance matrix in it, which means you're basing your updates, you're basing your learning on how certain you are um, on, on, and, and how much the variance and covariance structure informs your current update. Um, sigma here is the covariance and you'll be tracking that too, as well as um, learning your successor representation M. Um, Cool. Yeah. So key key factor here is that your updates are adaptive, depends on covariance matrix, and that's how you can incorporate uncertainty into learning. Um, so we can use this to um, explain some data, and we're going to start with a kind of uh, apparently incongruous effect about pre-exposure facilitation. Um, this is um, this is one that I really like. Um, so in in our paper from 2017, um, we modeled this thing called pre-exposure facilitation. Um, and pre-exposure facilitation um, looks like this. Um, it's, it's basically this effect where if you put an animal in an environment um, and let it explore that environment for a little bit um, before giving it some uh, negative outcome, in this case, a light foot shock, um, then you get a stronger conditioned response. Um, so here we see um, the pre-exposure bar is in blue and the non-pre-exposure bar is in red. Um, and the amount of freezing you see, the, the amount, uh, which is um, an experimental measure thought to relate to the strength of the associative um, link, um, is stronger for the pre-exposure condition. So more freezing, more afraid, more fear generalization. If the animal was pre-exposed to the environment, then if you just put it in the environment and then right away give it a foot shock before it's gotten its bearings. Um, if you lesion hippocampus, this effect decreases a lot. Um, and you can see this in this um, second um, bar on the right. This is the lesion condition. 
um, and you see a, a much weaker effect um, both in the pre-exposed and not pre-exposed condition. Um, so the way we modeled this back in the day um, is that as the animal has an opportunity to explore the environment, it learns associations about how different states relate to each other. Um, and once it can learn this, then it can generalize a negative outcome that it receives at one instant um, to the rest of the environment. Um, this, this predictive structure basically is an opportunity to generalize the, the fear across the entire environment and also to amplify the signal uh, because it learns about the, the containment structure of the environment. Um, um, so the key kind of headline here is pre-exposure facilitates learning. Um, however, there's kind of an opposite effect too called latent inhibition. Um, and this is something that Sam Gershman explained in, in his paper in a different way. Um, there's another set of findings that if you allow an animal to explore an environment um, for a really long time um, and nothing bad happens in that environment, then when it finally does um, receive, or nothing uh, bad or good happens in the environment, when it does finally receive a rewarding or negative outcome, it doesn't generalize from it um, because it treats it as an outlier. It basically says, I've been here for a long time. I'm pretty sure that uh, nothing, that if something bad has happened, it's not just a property of this environment per se. Um, it's, it seems like an outlier and I'm not gonna generalize. Um, and this is also something that has been reported in a different batch of findings, is that pre-exposure inhibits learning. Um, so these effects are, are kind of in blatant contradiction of each other. Um, however, one thing that you can um, do with this model is that because we're learning both um, a predictive structure and uncertainty about it, we can get these both in the same model and, and explain the transition from pre-exposure facilitation to inhibition. Um, so here what you see is that as a function of your time spent in the environment, you get this transition from having a facilitation to inhibition. Um, and this is because as the animal's exploring the environment, at first what it's doing is, is building up the, the first order statistic, the, the expectation about your state occupancy. Um, and then later with time, once it's already learned the first order statistics, it starts filling in the second order statistics as well. And you start to get not just predictions about where you're going to go, but, but certainty and confidence in those predictions. And then at that point, a new outcome is treated as an outlier. It's surprising and you don't generalize from it as much. Um, and this is something that was uh, actually reported by Kiernan and Westbrook in 1993, this transition from pre-exposure uh, facilitation to inhibition. Um, and what you see is that after two minutes of pre-exposure, lots, uh, lots of fear generalization, a strong conditioned response. Um, we're looking at this set of bars on the left-hand side. Um, and then after 20 minutes, you don't get as much uh, of a conditioned response anymore. You start getting um, latent inhibition. Um, so this is lovely because we can put these both in the same model and kind of bring together the, the inhibition and facilitation effects. Um, this effect here really leverages uh, the variance structure, the, the certainty about your state estimations, um, the, the diagonal entries of the covariance matrix. Um, we can also um, leverage these off diagonals too and leverage the covariance structure for something. Um, and what the covariance structure is most useful for is for doing non-local updates. Um, and um, we can illustrate this um, as follows. Um, in a transition revaluation experiment, uh, we're using a, a, a structure that um, was introduced by Momenajad and colleagues, and we'll also look at some of their data as well. Um, basically, the structure of the experiment is that you train um, humans or animals or agents on some sequence task where they move from state one to state two to state three. Um, you learn a transition matrix that looks like this one on the left, and this forms a successor representation that looks like this one on the right. Um, if we then change the structure so that instead of going from state three to uh, two to state three, they go to a new state four, um, then we wanna update our transition matrix. Um, and we can do this right away um, because um, the transition matrix has information that's really precise in time. Um, it's saying, where am I gonna go on one step to the other? So as soon as I see a new transition, I can update my transition matrix. But if I want to update my successor representation, which is storing these longer range predictions, that takes a longer time to propagate. Uh, because when I go from state two to state four now, that also changes my long-term predictions about what's going to happen from state one. Um, state one still thinks that eventually I'm going to end up in state three, um, and I need to inform state one that, that things are different now. Um, in the context of this um, three state, four state task, 
this maybe seems kind of simple. Um, in the context of a large maze where you've maybe introduced a new detour, you can imagine this becoming pretty computationally intractable. Um, and um, the classic successor representation will update really slowly under this account. But with Kalman TD, since we're keeping track of the covariance structure, we know that the predictions about state one to state two covary with the predictions that come from state two. So if we update state two, we're going to see changes in, in the states that predict it, which include state one. Um, so we um, wanted to look at some, some data that uh, Momenajad and colleagues um, got on this task. Um, and what they did in this task is a really lovely experimental design is they compared um, transition revaluation, this experimental condition where you're changing the transition structure of the task with reward revaluation where you're changing the reward structure. The sequences stay the same, but the reward values switch. Um, and that's what's happening as you go down this y-axis here. You have the original pre-trained sequences at the top, then the change, whether it's a sequence change or a reward change, um, and then you test them to see how they do. Um, and if you're a RL aficionado, you might be wondering, how does model free do? How does model based do? How do hybrid model free model based strategies do? Um, model free can't do this task at all. Um, it's not learning the underlying structure of the environment. It's just trying to um, cache expectations about how much expected reward um, follows from each state. So when you change something, its predictions are all scrambled. Model based, where you learn the full transition structure and reason about the sequences, make individual predictions about the entire trajectory, handles it fine. Um, and a hybrid strategy just kind of does halfway in between. It doesn't um, show any asymmetry between these conditions. Um, the successor representation um, does show asymmetry between this. The successor representation, if the dynamics stay the same, you have nothing to relearn there. Um, and if the dynamics or sequence structure changes, you do. So you have this difference between the lines. Um, and um, what, the, um, what the, the, the experimenters found is that there was an asymmetry, but it wasn't as entire as you might think. The subjects were still capable of doing well above chance under the transition revaluation condition, but they were a bit better at the reward revaluation condition. Um, and uh, Momenajad and colleagues modeled this with a hybrid successor representation that uses um, replay from a model in order to train up a successor representation. Um, and this does a lovely job explaining the data and also captures some of the reaction time data that subjects were a bit slower under the transition revaluation condition. Um, our model can also capture this um, and has some different computational trade-offs. Um, it can, rather than requiring replay, which can be a bit of a, a, a computationally intensive process uh, because it takes time to integrate these trajectories, um, it can do it somewhat instantaneously. It can say, I've tracked statistics about how these co-vary with each other, um, and I can apply that to do some degree of instantaneous um, transfer. Um, in this case, the reaction time effect would be interpreted as uncertainty or maybe some settling um, for the Kalman SR if you were to implement it in neural network form. Um, so it's kind of a different interpretation or at least like a, another algorithm with, with different computational trade-offs. Um, that's a, another way of integrating um, second order statistics. Um, so I, let's see, um, we're 40 minutes in, um, I'm gonna, um, briefly talk about, um, some of the, the additional step that Jesse added to the model. Um, and then I'll, I'll skip to some of the neural network stuff at the end. Um, but we'll, so we'll, we'll have time for everything. Um, so the, um, the results so far, we've been talking about uncertainty about predictions within an environment. Um, and, and capturing the, the structure of the distribution of, of uh, predictions within an environment. Um, we can extend this to have uncertainty, not just about your structure within an environment, but also your across environments and form a hierarchical model. Um, and um, this is illustrated in this little plot on the left-hand side. Um, basically, these different uh, differently colored distributions will correspond to different contexts. And in each context, we'll learn a probabilistic successor representation. Um, and this gives you two dimensions of uncertainty. One, which context am I in in the first place? And two, predictive structure within the context. Um, one of the things this is really useful for is capturing um, large discrete changes, um, or, or maybe it's safer to say just large changes um, in your predictive structure. Um, a Kalman filter um, is smooth over time. Um, that's that's a, a structure that's built into it. And if you have a really big change um, in your um, predictive structure, a success or a um, a Kalman a Kalman filter will take a really long time to adapt to it. That's what this blue line is showing in this plot in the middle. 
Um, if we start seeing new states in red, it'll take a really long time for the model to, to move its predictions over um, to adapt to the new world. Um, if you have a model that can make um, uh, inferences about context too, it can hop right over there and start making a new batch of predictions. Um, and this is really like, I think a nice intuition for what context is in, in general. It's, it's a probabilistic shorthand for the fact that sometimes you get these pretty um, sudden and, um, and complete changes in um, what you're observing. Um, this is the same perspective on context that, that Sam introduced in his latent cause model work as well, that um, you could just think about your entire um, experience as partaking in one task and different contexts have the role of allowing you to jump between different things and, and remember things that you've experienced a while ago um, while still having things be smooth within context. Um, so one of the things that we can model with um, this additional um, model aspect is context-specific uh, memory and forgetting. Um, so here we had a look at a study by Winokur et al. And the main idea of the study is that animals are conditioned in context A um, on the left, and then they're subsequently tested in both context A and context B after variable length delays. Um, sometimes the animals also saw a reminder of context A before they saw context B again. Um, and under this probabilistic model, um, non-recent contexts are going to have lower precision. Um, there's more time for um, the, the model's predictions to drift if it's not getting evidence about a particular context. Um, you'll start seeing uh, this, this collapse in the precision about your predictions as the, the model will continue updating itself under Gaussian assumptions without getting any information to the contrary. Um, so this means that recently, that if you um, have recently seen a context, um, your prediction, your, your expected probability that you're in that context um, is going to be very low unless you're a close match to what that context looked like. Um, whereas if you have uh, more time that's passed and this Gaussian has collapsed, then you'll start generalizing this more broadly. Um, you'll have less precision about, or less certainty about exactly what your context um, looks like. And um, different information is more likely to be falsely interpreted as that context, even if it's kind of far away from what the features of that context look like. Um, so this matches nicely um, some predictions that were uh, some, some experiments done by Winokur et al. Um, so basically what Winokur et al found um, is that um, with, with time, with an increasing number of days, animals were more likely to generalize a response from context A to context B. Um, so in 20, after only 24 hours, this gray bar showing generalization to context B um, is very low. But after 28 days, they show a pretty large um, fear response to condition B. Um, so the, the fear response is, is growing with time, which we interpret under our model as this uh, loss of precision that allows generalization to occur. Um, this um, effect is um, disappears. Oops, sorry. This effect disappears um, if they're re-exposed to context A right before they see context B. So if they're reminded what context B looks like, this, this goes away. Um, and this happens um, under our model too. You can see these same uh, lines happening in orange, which correspond to the gray lines. Um, another thing that the authors see is that um, generalization within context A also grows with time. Um, and we don't actually see that. We actually see that it uh, decreases a little bit. Um, and then more exposure to context A uh, increases this. We do see that part of the effect, um, but we don't see this, this first one. That's a, um, a, a decrease. Um, uh, okay, so I'll just briefly mention some other um, work we've been doing in this space, trying to um, use predictive representations to um, get new um, insights about um, hippocampal contributions to learning. Um, this is also work that was done by Jesse um, using a two system model to um, contextualize hippocampal contributions um, to learning and dorsolateral striatal um, connections to learning. Um, and um, this model. Um, it was motivated by some results um, from uh, Vic Blad and all, um, work done with um, Neil Burgess and uh, Nathaniel Daw, um, showing that subjects that have uh, human subjects, human patients that have hippocampal damage um, show some impairments on spatial reasoning as well as model-based reasoning indexed um, in something called the two-step task. Um, so basically it's, it's a um, cross-modality, not just spatial navigation effect that you see. 
Um, so here for this model, Jesse wanted to try and um, explain how uh, th this, this effect by using a model that could capture both spatial reasoning as well as more general um, reasoning about uh, a model. And the successor representation, because it's anchored to temporal statistics rather than spatial coordinates, um, can serve this role. Um, so this model is useful for explaining transitions from allocentric to egocentric strategies, effects of lesion studies um, on spatial and non-spatial decision making for humans and rodents. Um, came out a little while ago. Um, I encourage you to check it out or happy to answer questions during the period, question period. Um, we also had some recent work with a graduate student, Tom George, um, who um, works um, also works with Claudia Clopath. Um, as well as Caswell Berry, uh, although this was worked on with in his uh, rotation before he started working with Claudia. Um, and this is um, a, a project on how um, successor representations can be implemented in a biologically plausible way, um, or maybe more specifically like hippocampally plausible. How can we take aspects of uh, hippocampal phenomenology and show how this relates to hippocampal learning? Um, so basically there's already um, a, a lot known about how STDP might work, um, and how um, sequences organize themselves in hippocampus. Um, and Tom showed that this um, can allow really efficient learning of a predictive representation that's not quantitatively the same as a successor representation, uh, but has the core qualitative features in common. Um, this paper came out along the same time as um, uh, Ching Fang, um, working with uh, Larry Abbott and Dmitry Aronov, um, and um, uh, Bono and colleagues working with Claudia Klopath also came out with models of biologically plausible successor representation implementations. Each of these models has a, a kind of different angle and they came out in the same eLife edition, which was uh, really cool. Um, and then finally, some, some recent work that was, that, uh, uh, was presented at CCN um, and, and hopefully will come out soon um, is some work that Ching Fang um, at Columbia has been doing with predictive auxiliary ob objectives in the context of deep reinforcement learning. Um, so here we're really interested in the question um, of how uh, predictive auxiliary objectives um, can not just be used downstream for reasoning and planning, but also can be used um, to force feature learning upstream. Um, and this is actually a role that predictive learning often serves in the context of um, reinforcement learning when using deep neural networks, um, is that you can have much, much better representations of the important features of your environment if you're not just trying to predict how rewarding each state is, but also try and predict what's going to happen too. Um, cool. So in, in the last five minutes, I'm going to talk um, really briefly about a, a different kind of predictive system and some uh, neural network techniques that we've been using to model them. Um, here we're thinking about um, a, a kind of different predictive system, whereas previously the kind of implicit assumption is that um, you can have that the predictive structure that we're modeling, the, uh, the, the, um, the structure is a bunch of different states you can be in and how you can connect between them, um, with the assumption you can really only be in one state at a time. Um, here we're going to have your, your state at any given point in time characterized by a graph characterized by a set of, of nodes in your environment um, and edges that join them, um, with the, um, the dynamics being determined by interactions between nodes in a neighborhood. Um, so, whoops, sorry. Oh, um, this is a, a useful framework for modeling um, complex systems. Um, a lot of physics has the um, latent assumption underlying it that um, interactions are going to be local. So if we represent, for instance, the motion of flag of, of, a, of a flag um, over a set of points on a mesh, um, then momentum will propagate through the flag such that um, vertices on this flag are going to have an effect in a local neighborhood and it will take time for things to propagate further. Um, similarly, if we consider a set of particles in a fluid system, um, particles really can only have an interaction um, as far as uh, the collision distance in, in the time step you're using. Um, so uh, we, can, we can learn um, the, the local rules of what's gonna happen when little fluid particles bump into each other um, and then extrapolate this to much larger scenes. Um, so the core mechanism that we used to do this is something called graph neural networks. Um, the way they work is that you break your scene into a set of entities, nodes, fluid particles, um, whatever you want to call them, um, and you make your computation about how the system will evolve um, as a function of neighborhoods of interacting particles. And so here's a really simplified example of, of a graph. Um, each of these nodes might correspond to some particle in your scene. Um, 
you're um, going to aggregate information from your neighborhood. So each node will get information from the neighboring nodes. Um, and then you'll pass that information through a neural network to get new representations um, for that node. Um, so each node is processed by a uh, neural network that takes in information about the local surroundings um, and then updates to get a new value. Um, with each iteration, information can propagate through the graph. So if you apply this step many times, you can start aggregating information from further and further away and build up a kind of hierarchical representation um, the way convolutional neural networks work over images. Um, key things we like about this approach, one is that it works for lots of different kinds of domains. Um, a lot of different physical systems can be broken down into sets of nodes and their interactions. Um, and another thing is that it generalizes um, very nicely in a particular way. Um, so generally, neural networks don't do a great job on unfamiliar data. Um, and that would mean that if we train a model on um, simple systems like we see in these inset columns, maybe um, really small fields of view of just a fluid block falling on a single ramp, um, then if we tried to extrapolate to this much larger scene with more complex dynamics, it wouldn't necessarily work. Um, that's out of distribution. The, network would return garbled nonsense. Um, but because we're breaking this, um, this scene down into little parts and learning about them, and because the behavior of the entire scene can be described as these um, sets of points, um, then we can learn local functions and then arrange them into different global arrangements and have the model generalized well. Um, so these are really useful properties. Um, these are This is work um, done by other folks that I work with, um, but I was uh, not on most of them. Um, one of them uh, was a uh, fluid dynamic simulation paper I, I uh, co-authored a long time ago, or not that long ago, actually. Um, so the, the work I wanted to briefly mention, uh, because I think it has some really interesting implications for reasoning and also just applications in neuroengineering, um, is using these kind of simulators for design. Um, this is a paper um, that we uh, put out in 2022. Um, I'm the third of three first uh, authors on this paper. I worked with Kelsey Allen, who you might know because she's done really lovely work in the adjacent field of cognitive science, as well as machine learning, and Tatiana uh, Guevara Lopez, a, a roboticist. Um, and we wanted to see if we could use these learned simulators for design problems, um, things that might be useful across different application fields um, or just models of, of human reasoning, something Kelsey's really interested in. Um, so we set up a, a set of uh, different reasoning problems representative of different challenges in the design world. Um, and we set up a design pipeline using the learned simulator. Um, so the pipeline um, looked like this. We would start with some parameterized design space. Here we have the parameters of a mesh over which we're going to drop some fluid. Now, if we drop some fluid and the learned simulator um, makes a prediction about how this system will evolve over time, and then we can evaluate reward under that prediction for just a random task we make up. In this case, we want to see how much fluid we can put into these little purple um, pools. We call this the pools task. Um, and now that we've set up this pipeline um, that goes from design that we want to optimize to reward, we can try to optimize it. Um, and so we'll start with a design that's not very good and gradually refine it into something better. Um, you might note that this um, entire process is differentiable because we're using a neural network to make this prediction. So even though there's a lot of steps between the input design and the reward, we can use gradient-based methods um, to try and optimize these designs. Um, the kind of key thing we were curious about is, would this work? Because there's a lot of steps that it has to go through and because these design problems have really different solutions from anything seen in the training data. Um, so we have kind of a challenging generalization problem as well as an optimization problem. Um, so the fact that uh, graph neural networks generalize in the way they do is really important here. Um, we find briefly that it does work. Um, we're able to um, solve um, a variety of different problems with this approach. Um, it has some strengths, it has some weaknesses, um, but the gist of it is that we're, we're able to solve um, different problems and get good solutions. Um, so here you can see a couple different solutions of, of our method. Um, and because we can use gradient-based optimization, um, we can optimize pretty efficiently, even for really large designs, um, which sampling-based methods often struggle with. Um, 
So um, for, for, for future directions um, in general, I'm really interested in seeing how we can apply um, a lot of these methods um, to for new machine learning directions and also new neuroscience directions. Um, on the neuroscience side, I'm especially interested in how structured representations in the brain support flexible behavior. Um, and I've become increasingly interested in how we can use structured neural networks to do this, to trade off the expressiveness as well as the, the, the structure and interpretability of, of uh, different special architectures. Um, and also how we can get machines um, to represent the same kind of, of uh, structure to support flexible reasoning. Um, so I, I'm um, essentially out of time. Um, so I will um, skip to the acknowledgements uh, instead of elaborating on the future work. Um, I wanna give a heartfelt thank you to collaborators um, on these projects, um, Kelsey and Tatiana um, in particular for uh, collaborating on the inverse design work with graph neural networks. Um, Jesse, who led the Kalman SR work um, and, and did a, a really fantastic job with that, um, as well as other uh, mentors and collaborators um, over the years.